So we know that Lewis theory is governed by the octet rule. Most representative elements form chemical bonds to gain a full set of eight valence electrons. There are definitely exceptions to this rule, however, and in this PowerPoint, we'll talk about those exceptions. The exceptions to the octet rule tend to fall into one of three categories. These are free radicals. These are molecules that actually have an odd number of electrons. Electron deficient molecules. These are molecules that have atoms that accept less than eight valence electrons. Molecules with hydrogen are one example of this type of molecule, but there are others. And finally, hypervalent molecules. These are molecules that have atoms that accept more than eight valence electrons. So let's start with free radicals. These types of molecules are rare because they tend to be very reactive. They can occur, however. For example, during combustion at high temperatures, the free radical nitrogen monoxide, which is also known as nitric oxide, is formed. Let's try drawing the Lewis structure for this molecule. Our first step is to determine the total number of valence electrons in the molecule. So we know that nitrogen is from column 15, that's five valence electrons, and oxygen is in column 16, that's six. Five plus six gives us a total of 11 valence electrons. This is an odd electron molecule. Our next step is to draw a skeleton structure of the molecule. There are only two atoms here, so this is pretty easy. Nitrogen and oxygen connected by a single dash or one shared pair between them. So we'll have to actually subtract out that shared pair from our total valence electron to give us the number of electrons we have left to place as lone pairs. So 11 minus two gives us nine electrons left to place. There's no way that we're gonna be able to get both atoms with a full octet. Since oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen, we'll go ahead and give it the full amount and we'll let nitrogen be the one that's electron deficient. So this is what we get. We subtract out those nine unshared electrons that we just placed from our total, and we now have zero electrons left to place. So our fourth rule, place any remaining valence electrons in the central atom, does not apply. Now, while we can't give nitrogen a full octet because we have an odd number of electrons, we can at least get it closer to eight by forming a double bond with oxygen. So if oxygen shares one of its lone pairs with the nitrogen, nitrogen will actually have seven electrons. And our final Lewis structure will look like this. Electron deficient molecules contain an atom that accepts less than eight valence electrons. A prime example of this is hydrogen, of course, but there are two other elements that are sometimes found with less than eight valence electrons. These are beryllium and boron. So both of these Lewis structures as drawn are valid Lewis structures, but notice that the central atom contains less than eight in each. For the first structure, beryllium dihydride, the beryllium only has four valence electrons on it. It's just those electrons that are shared with hydrogen. There are no lone pairs there. In boron trifluoride, the second structure, boron forms three single bonds, so that's six shared electrons, but again, no lone pairs on that central atom. So it's got a total of six. So why don't these molecules form double bonds so that the central atom has that full set of eight? Well, in beryllium dihydride, there simply aren't enough extra electrons to share. Beryllium only has two valence electrons to begin with. It's from column two of the periodic table. And hydrogen, each of those just brings one valence electrons. That gives us four valence electrons total, and all four of those are shared in those two single bonds. There are no extra to place as lone pairs. There are no extra to share. In 
In the boron trifluoride example, though, the fluorines certainly have lone pair electrons that they could share with boron and actually form double bonds. So why doesn't this happen? It turns out that experimental evidence indicates that there is no double bond formation in this molecule. It turns out that single bonds are longer than double bonds. And so you can measure bond length to indicate what type of bond is actually formed. And when they measure the bond length for boron trifluoride, trifluoride all three of those bonds are the exact same length and they are all much closer to what a single bond length would be than a double bond. Furthermore, when they look at the chemical reactivity of boron trifluoride, it matches what you would expect for an electron deficient molecule. Boron trifluoride is very reactive because that boron is out there actively looking for an extra set of electrons, something to bond with so that it can get its full set of eight. Here's an example of that reactivity. Electron deficient molecules tend to react very quickly with other molecules that contain an atom with lone pair electrons, like the nitrogen on the ammonia in this particular example. Boron very quickly forms a single bond with that nitrogen so that it can share that lone pair and gain its full set of eight. If that boron actually had double bond with one of those fluorines, then that would be less likely to happen because the boron would already have its full set of eight valence electrons. So the fact that we see this reaction occur for boron trifluoride and that it occurs very, very quickly confirms that boron is actually electron deficient in this molecule. Our last exception to the octet rule are hypervalent molecules. So these molecules contain an atom that actually accepts more than eight valence electrons. And this is possible when an element is from the third row of the periodic table or higher. These elements actually have access to D sublevels in the third energy level or higher than that. And as a result, they can actually accept more than eight electrons by putting the extras into those D orbitals. Two examples are sulfur hexafluoride and xenon tetrafluoride. So this last molecule is one of the few experimentally created compounds formed with a noble gas. Let's draw the Lewis structure for each of these, and we'll start by figuring out our total number of valence electrons. For sulfur hexafluoride, sulfur is from column 16, so that's six valence electrons. Fluorine is from column 17, so each of those fluorines brings seven valence electrons. That's 42 from fluorine, and the total is 48. Now for xenon tetrafluoride, the xenon, of course, brings eight to the table. Each fluorine brings seven, so that's 28 from the fluorine, and a total of 36 valence electrons. Next, we'll draw the skeletal structure for each molecule. Both sulfur and xenon are considered less electronegative than fluorine, so they'll be the central atom in each. And we'll place the appropriate amounts of fluorine around them and connect each to that central atom with a single bond. Now, in sulfur hexafluoride, because there are six fluorines in that first molecule, this indicates six single bonds attached to sulfur. So automatically, we have more than eight valence electrons on that central atom. As long as that central atom is from the third row of the periodic table or higher, though, this is possible, and this is an acceptable Lewis structure. For xenon tetrafluoride, it's not immediately clear that we're going to end up with more than eight electrons on that xenon, since we only have four single bonds drawn around it right now. But let's continue with our steps and see what happens. So first, I need to subtract out the number of electrons that I just placed in bonds. So for sulfur hexafluoride, I have six single bonds. 
each with two electrons, I subtract that out from my total of 48, and that leaves me with 36 electrons left to place. In xenon tetrafluoride, there are four bonds, each with two electrons. I subtract that from 36, and I now have 28 valence electrons left to place. And I'm going to start by placing them on all of the terminal atoms, all of those fluorines. So each one of those gets six unshared electrons, three lone pairs. So here is my sulfur hexafluoride, and here is my xenon tetrafluoride. So let's see how many electrons we have left. For sulfur hexafluoride, we start with 48. We subtract out the electrons that are shared in bonds. I have six bonds, each with two electrons. And we also subtract out those lone pair electrons that we just placed, six on each fluorine atom. And that actually leaves us with zero electrons. We have placed all of the electrons that we have. For xenon tetrafluoride, we do the same basic thing. We have 36 valence electrons to start. We subtract out our four bonds, each with two electrons, and we also subtract out the lone pair electrons that we just placed on those four fluorine atoms. And that leaves us with four electrons left over. So what do we do with those extra four electrons? Well, we place them on the central atom. And because xenon is from a lower row on the periodic table, it's actually from the fifth row of the periodic table, it can accept those extra valence electrons in the D sublevels. So xenon actually has 12 valence electrons on it. Four of those electrons are considered lone pair, and eight are considered shared pairs in bonds with fluorine. So our last step in the Lewis structure process is always to just check and make sure that all of the atoms have the full set of valence electrons that they're willing to accept. So if any of our atoms had less than eight, then we would rearrange electrons of the outer atoms to make multiple bonds. But that's not the situation here. For both of these molecules, every atom involved has at least eight, if not more than eight. And those that have more than eight are from the third period or higher. So these Lewis structures are acceptable. In summary, there are three types of exceptions to the octet rule. Molecules that are free radicals, that means they have an odd number of electrons. Electron deficient molecules, those that contain atoms with less than eight valence electrons. These include molecules that have hydrogen, as well as some molecules that contain the elements beryllium or boron. And finally, hypervalent molecules. These are molecules that contain atoms with more than eight valence electrons, and these atoms have to be from elements that are in the third period of the periodic table or higher.